a little bit about street law. Um, Shirley gave you our mission, but we're a global um, nonpartisan nonprofit organization. Mm -hmm. uh, we started working in the US and then in the 1980s uh, expanded into South Africa. And now as we said, we've worked in over 45 countries around the world over the course of our history. Um, our programs really uh, focus on four areas. And these are, these are interrelated, right? One is building civic agency. How do you help people become able to you know, advocate for themselves? Another is advancing equity and justice. Uh, a third is building bridges across differences. And then the, the fourth is fostering democratic culture. Uh, that's the end. end. Yeah. We need to go all the way back. All right. So before I start doing more talking, I'm going to ask people to do a little work yourselves, right? I'd like you to think about someone that is a good citizen. Maybe someone that you know, possibly a relative, could be some a historical figure. But just think in your mind about that person who you consider a good citizen. And as you're thinking about that good citizen, think for a few minutes or a few seconds about why you believe they're a good citizen. What made them a good citizen? Somebody, you know, just yeah. it, it always goes back to my parents. Everybody knows this story here by now, but I have to tell it again and again, and it's more important than ever because they didn't join the Nazis. They stood up to it in little ways. No? In big newspaper just in their neighborhood as good citizens. Okay. So your parents, your parents were good citizens and a key reason was that they did not join the Nazi party during the, the yeah. when Hitler was in yeah. power. Yes, Jim. Uh, to my late cousin, uh -huh. uh, who was very involved in her community uh, and um, who ended up running for City Council in Ames, Iowa, where Iowa State University is, and who uh, looked into housing, uh, became very active in that, mm -hmm. uh, got the community to agree to invite uh, poor people from Chicago area to move and help pay for them to come so that they weren't just dealing theoretically with uh, race and and poverty issues, or whether there were already mm -hmm. poverty issues there, but anyway, uh, really dug into uh, trying to create a more equal, equitable society. Great. Um, I'll summarize and then I'll have one more. And if people on Zoom, if you want to put answers into the chat, that would be great as well. If anyone would like to volunteer about their who they chose. So, Joan, your late cousin. Who I'm not going to I'm not going to, to um, do justice to everything that you just extolled about her, but was very active in her community. I think ran for office. Is that city council? City council in, in, in Ames, Iowa, in thirty thousand people, and was very active. I know one of the things you mentioned was homelessness and housing issues, and schools. And schools. Is there any? Would maybe one more person, Jean? Oh, a ninth grade teacher. Ninth grade teacher. In the whole class, in any issue that came up in Denver, racial issues and housing were fundamental. And we had talked about that every day. Great. So, your ninth grade Maybe teacher. That was his mission. Your ninth grade teacher uh, talking about fundamental issues around racism and housing and just integrated that into the daily conversations in your school. Um, so, now I'm going to ask you to think a little bit broader. So first you were thinking about a person who is a good citizen. Now thinking about good citizenship in general, 
what does a good citizen need to know? What should they believe? And what should they do? So we take just a few seconds to think about that. And here is in the chat. I want to read that. Or I can read it. Nancy. Uh, it seems like they have to believe in their own power to um, create change mm -hmm. uh, and maybe have some, I think, belief in um, the social institutions, the institutions of government that can um, maybe help um, affect any the changes or what they believe in. So believing in their own power, mm -hmm. believing in their ability to make change, and believing in the social institutions of government. Mm -hmm. um, and and Chuck, yes. in. in. Uh, Jose says, uh, the people I, who I knew as good citizens had this quality to keep everyone engaged at whatever their main issue was uh, as, as well. So, so leadership. To keep people in leadership, keeping people engaged. Is there anything, anyone else like a volunteer, either a, a, something a good citizen should know or believe or do? Just like, basic, you need to know the law. You need to know the law. And to follow the law as a good citizen. Okay, so you need to know the law and then doing is following the law. And in order to change things, you need to know the basics. And you need to know the basics. And, and I believe in history. If you don't know history, you don't know why things happen. So knowing the law, knowing history, uh, this gets to those, those um, troubling headlines about not knowing, about you know, knowing how your government yeah. works, knowing yeah. the branches. I think it's important that we teach our younger generation mm -hmm. the importance of voting. Voting. And that's one of the things I've tried to do with my own children. Okay. So there's a <laughs> belief in voting and then the action of voting action. itself. Anyone else? I'll take one more, Jane. Understanding of the separation of church and state. Separation of church and state. They've done that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's why I wrote The Christian okay. nationalism is coming. Okay, separation of church and state. Mm -hmm. So these are the same questions that civic education wrestles with in our schools, right? How do we prepare young people to be future good citizens? What do they need to know? What, what do they need to believe? And what skills do they need to have in order to do the things a good citizen does? And I will say that one, you know, one, one thing that came up and often comes up is voting. And of course, that's very particular to one definition of citizenship. Someone who is has the legal rights of a citizen in this country or any other. But citizenship has a broader meaning as well as the members of a community. So some of the things that a good citizen does are, are things that anyone can do um, in the community. And some things may be particular to having a certain status as a legal citizen. Um, so I want to get. To, I want to start talking a bit about then what is good civic learning or good civic education, and here are six proven practices that uh, civic education experts have agreed upon for the past so decade or more. Um, one is courses on civics, government, law, and related topics. So specific courses on this, and teachers who have the skill to be able to teach those courses, right? Another is deliberations about current and contested issues. So you don't just want to lecture at people. Students should be able to, to talk and think about and wrestle with difficult issues. Service learning is another thing. So this is you know, volunteering in a community and then linking that to your academic learning as well. Uh, it's a way for, for youth to also understand sometimes the root causes of problems in the community. Student-led voluntary associations. So all those clubs and things that, that students participate in in schools and having being able to take a leadership role. Uh, student voice in schools, that's oftentimes through something like student government where they actually have some influence in what happens in their school. And then the, the last of these, these proven practices where there's a lot of research showing that these are effective is uh, simulations. So, you know, things like mock elections or model UN, which is something I was very influential with me when I was a, a student, 
um, mock trials, moot courts, things like that, where you actually get to play the role of a, an activist. Next slide. And then the same publication has uh, named some complementary practices where the evidence isn't quite as strong, but it's showing that there's a, uh, but there is a growing body of evidence about the importance of these two as, as uh, important parts of good civic learning. One is news media education. We know that um, it's becoming more and more difficult for people to source um, legitimate news from you know, illegitimate news. So understanding what a, what a good um, uh, media source is, whether that's on social media, whether that's online, or whether that's traditional media. Um, action civics, and that's where students actually have a role in looking at things that they want to change in their community and maybe even proposing policy changes or interacting with their, their local or state or even national government leaders. Um, that's a, a newer field and has been is uh, has some controversy behind it. Uh, social and emotional learning, the idea that it's not just the knowledge, but you need to develop social skills to be a good citizen. And then school climate reform. And this refers a lot to things that are happening in school around school to prison pipeline, disciplinary practices in schools that um, that um, have a negative effect on people's belief in the system. All right. Thanks. Another thing I wanted to mention is the Education for Democracy Roadmap. And this is something that came out a couple of years ago. Um, it got a lot of press at the time. And so you, you may have seen it. Um, Judy Woodruff from PBS helped to launch it. So she talked about it on, on PBS for those who listened to that. And this was a really interesting initiative where um, iCivics and Arizona State University and Harvard and Tufts University spent two years really bringing together several hundred different um, teachers and educators, and including a couple of my colleagues, um, to look at what would be a framework, a common framework for um, history and civic education in the US. Um, and I think one thing is, you know, it was an intentionally bringing together people with different political views, trying to come to something that we could, we could agree on in a very partisan landscape. Um, it, it is a framework. It's not telling schools what to do. It is, they emphasize quite a bit that it is not an idea of coming up with a national curriculum, even though there's been some incorrect reporting that it is. And it's really geared around questions. So not saying things like, um, you know, name the th just name the three branches, but questions about like, how has the balance of power evolved in the US over time between the three branches? So things like that. So things that really, um, have students think and analyze and, and use these critical thinking skills and, you know, being able to do things like look at primary sources uh, so they're not just relying on someone else's uh, opinion. Uh, yeah, so this is And there were some design challenges that this EAD roadmap zeroed in on. And, by design challenges, these are really key difficulties in the U.S. Uh, now, how we shape uh, civic education, right? And and these are things that you know, as we as we hear about sometimes these partisan arguments, um, I think it's important to remember that this is hard. We're a really big, diverse country. The experiences in one state versus the other, the experiences of one community versus other. It, you know, they, there's a lot to try to pack in, and of course, we can't teach everything about civics or history in, you know, in certainly in the, the, the one semester civics that oftentimes students get, but even if we were teaching about it nonstop for the entire 12 years, right, there's, we have to make choices about what's in that curriculum or not. So one of the design challenges is motivating agency. How do you educate young people about our system in a way that they're still motivated to be part of it and to support it and to vote and volunteer in their community and do all those good things that a good citizen should do. Because sometimes when you learn about it, it can be just to be motivated. And sometimes if you're, um, you know, if, if the way the way that civics is taught can be demotivating. We want, we want this to be something that, that motivates young people. Another, this is a big one, America's plural yet shared story. Um, and I'm using the language from the EAD roadmap. How do we educate young people about the various different communities and identities that we have 
many of which have been traditionally lost. You know, we many of us in the room probably didn't uh, learn about you know the things involving uh, certainly about the LGBT community or different ethnic groups or different racial groups or the role that you know women play. Uh, we that's something that we probably didn't uh, learn about as extensively as as should have been taught. So how do we teach about those different communities without just te without um, while still cultivating an idea that we're one people, that we have a shared identity as well? Right? How do you find that balance? It's a, it's a challenge. Um, another one is is celebrating and critiquing compromise. You know, over time, particularly in, in politics, in order to get things done, you do have to make compromises. Um, so when is that a good thing? When is that a bad thing? And then the, this last one, um, civic honesty and reflective patriotism. So how do we look at the negative parts of our history, the negative parts of our country, while still appreciating what it is to be patriotic in a positive way? So no, there aren't any answers to these. These are just mostly questions that, particularly as these, these several hundred people came together, uh, they identified as some of the more difficult struggles in designing uh, social study standards, designing curriculum, designing in 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 you know deciding what you're going to teach in the classroom. All right, I, I wanted to um, also talk about a uh, a really recent study. Uh, this was done last year, and uh, they just launched it about in March um, at UCLA Institute for Democracy, Education, and Access. And I thought this was really interesting because they um, they were looking at polarization in schools, and they surveyed about 700 principals from across the U.S., different communities, and then they broke that down by whether those were politically red communities or blue or purple. And I think just some of the findings um, and the implications um, found a bit um, interesting. So um, these next few slides are all from this study. So one is that um, the, the number of students in classrooms making a political, making demeaning or hateful comments to other students because of those students' political beliefs, being either conservative or liberal, that's, that's gone up. And when they survey principals, so what you, I know this is hard to read, but basically <laughs> what you find is that principals in Red and blue areas, about a third of them said, no, that hasn't happened. Um, a little under half of them say, yeah, it's happened once or twice that I've, that I've heard about. And then about 20% uh, in red and blue areas say, yes, this has happened multiple times. But when you look at purple areas, when you look at areas where the community is a mixture of different political beliefs, you find that the number of times that principals say it's happened multiple times shoots up almost a third of principles. Um, still about half say it's happened once or twice, but the number of them say it hasn't happened really drops. It drops to less than 20%. So what we're seeing is that students among themselves in um, purple areas are much more, are more likely to be making negative comments to each other based on the other's political beliefs. Next. Um, and here's a change. You know, they, they did the survey in 2022, and they've done a similar survey in 2018. So this slide and the next one, uh, there's some interesting data about how this has changed in the past four years. So this is a um, these were principals who said, you know, parents have called me complaining about the the sources or the materials that teachers are, are using in schools. And what we find is that. Um, you know, this was relatively low in 2018 um, among red, purple, uh, blue areas, everyone combined. It was between you know 11 to 14 percent of principals said, Yes, this has happened. But in 2022, that's increased for everyone, but it's increased in particular for purple areas. So, um, you know, for blue areas, uh, the number of those you know parents complaining, um, went up a little bit, went up eight percent. Um, in red areas, it actually went up less, went up 5%. But in purple areas, there's a 35% increase in the number of times that principals are getting complaints from parents complaining about what's being taught in the classroom, complaining about the sources. And then the next. And this I also found really kind of disturbing. 
You know, earlier we talked about one of the good practices of effective civic learning is talking about contested issues in classrooms. But what we're finding is that in the past four years, the professional development offered to teachers to be able to do that well, because it's not, a, it's not an easy thing to do that. And it's really difficult to do. I mean, it's very easy to do it badly. But the amount of professional development being offered to teachers has dropped, in, particularly in purple areas. So between 2000, and, so if you look at um, you know, 2018, red, purple, blue areas, you know, 40 to 54% were offering this professional development. But in 2022, there's a 21% decrease in purple areas. So the teachers in those areas where the young people are most likely to be making negative comments to their peers, where the young people are most likely to have different beliefs among themselves, so you can have an interesting conversation about these contested issues, those are the teachers that their professional development has dropped the most in the past years. Question. Yeah. Go back to that previous slide. Well, the title of that is Declining mm -hmm. Professional Development. Yep. So I don't know how to interpret the change. Uh -huh. Does that mean in the blue and red areas there was more professional development or more decline? That, that means that in 2018, when they surveyed principals and said, do you offer professional development for your teachers on teaching about these issues? 45% in blue areas, 54% in purple areas, 40% in red areas said, yes, we do. When they asked that same question in 2022, that dropped. Uh, actually, in blue areas, it went up slightly, but in purple areas, whereas more than half of the principals in 2018 said, yes, we're offering that kind of professional development for our teachers. Only a third of them were offering that in 2022. Yeah. So people are running scared. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you, they didn't say, you know, what the reasoning behind this is. I mean, it's possible that maybe yeah. schools have less money for professional development. But I think when you look at the, the atmosphere and if you look at the anecdotal um, things in that, you know, the, the quotes that they had from principals, there certainly is um, a level of fear. And, and, yeah. um, okay, so some good news, um, and it's that civic education does have bipartisan support. Um, iCivics did a survey, uh, a national survey in September, right before the midterm elections, and they were asking um, people who voted in the GOP primaries, in the, the Democratic primaries, or who intended to, to, to vote, um, you know, what they thought about civics. And basically, um, there's a pretty good agreement. 79% said that teaching more about civics is important. And that that the number of Republicans and Democrats were, were pretty similar there. Um, and then also 69% uh, said it's more important now than it was five years ago. And again, strong support both from Republicans, uh, Republican voters and Democratic voters for the importance of civic education and the recognition that it's more important now than it was five years ago. And then the last, I think, positive news I want to mention is that there is a, a, a piece of legislation um, that's in, been introduced into Congress called the Civic Sphere of Democracy Act. It's a bipartisan piece of legislation. Um, so we've got, uh, so there is a, a you know, good number of both Democratic and Republicans and a, and a balanced um, number that are co-introducing this. And if it was passed, it would, it would increase the funding for civic education and really provide more resources both for, um, for schools to offer this in professional development for teachers um, to teach civics as well. So, this is the this is sort of where I'm concluding, just talking about the the state of civic education in the U.S. Um, so, so I hope that what you're walking away is um, what it is to be uh, to have good civic learning. And I think one of the things that is my takeaway when I read these reports is that it is much more than sitting in a classroom and reading a book or having someone lecture to you. It's about the things that you do both in the classroom and outside. It's about students really being able to wrestle with the types of problems that they're going to encounter um, as when they leave school. 
And in some cases, it's about students being able to wrestle with those problems and look for ways to make change, even while they're in schools with things like uh, uh, action civics. Yes. But that requires critical thinking. And if you don't yeah. learn that from home or from school, if you don't have critical thinking uh, qualities, then how can you say, no, this is not, not going with this? And that gets to how civics is being taught. Um, you know, right. one of the, one of the um, civic, civic learning mm -hmm. in schools um, from what I've read um, has declined over the past 20 years, in part because we put so much attention on things like math and, and English and STEM, right. all which are very good things, right? Um, but it, kind of, it, it squeezed out some of the space for social studies yeah. and, and civics. Um, and that's and now there's interesting growing that. I think there's a growing recognition, certainly that I've heard both in schools and from business leaders and, and others about um, the negative effects of that decline in civic learning in schools. But it does, um, the important part also is not just that people are learning facts, but the way in which it's taught. So they're learning, you know, skills. I mean, we started at the beginning of this thinking about, it's not just knowledge, right? It's, it's beliefs, but it's also skills and critical thinking is an essential one. Um, Could you say some words about iCivics? Yeah. As so a program I, I just, excuse me, yeah. do I need to keep this on or not? Um, well, I do have some more slides okay, to get to. Um, yeah, iCivics is one of several organizations, uh, and Sweet Law is another one, that um, promotes uh, civic education in the U.S. Um, it's one of the largest. Uh, they're really a, a, um, a uh, leading organization in even gaming. So there are, if you go to iCivics, you can actually create your own account and you can play games on things like, you know, to learn about the constitution, you can, you know, pretend to be at a law office and trying to, you know, someone comes in and complains about this issue and you say, no, that's not a constitutional issue or it's this amendment. Um, they, they do mock voting. They do a lot of really interesting games that are also used in schools. So they reach about 7 million people through those, those online gaming. Um, and then there are also a number of other organizations, nonprofits like ours that do uh, good civic education work. Um, there's, uh, and, and iCivics is also a group that has brought us together around advocacy and around field building. So um, that's why some of the studies, uh, the survey and some of the studies were ICIFICS. Uh, so yeah, it's a great organization. Did they mention student government in the school? Uh, because it was yeah. very strong in the school I grew up in. Yeah, student government, that's one of those six proven practices. It's students having a voice in the way their school is run. Mm -hmm. And so student government is uh, probably one of the most common ways to do that. Um, and one thing I want to say about, one other thing I want to say is one reason why um, civic education has not had the attention sometimes is because it's not tested in the way that math and science and other things are. Mm -hmm. um, and there are some states that have put in uh, a, a test that you have to pass in order to graduate from high school around mm -hmm. civics. But the most common one is just passing the U.S. citizenship test. And again, that focuses on knowledge, but it doesn't focus on skills or beliefs or those other key things. Um, okay, I've got a few minutes. I want to say a little bit more about street law and then any other questions. So what up? Uh, next slide. Mm -hmm. So here's some things. One of the things that we're very well known for is really creating high quality uh, materials for teachers around teaching about civics. So we have a couple of uh, textbooks for the United States government that we co-author, a textbook called street law, because there are a number of high schools in the U.S. that either have a course called street law or have a course called like Law and Society or something like that. And that this one is the, the most common textbook they use. But then we also have a number of things that teachers can go online and like download or use for free. But, um, deliberations is one part. So we talked about you know, teaching about controversial issues is a difficult thing to do in a classroom. So we've got some materials that teachers can go, they can download, they can use those lessons. They've been tested, developed, we, they're, they're uh, bipartisan, they're, they're, they don't lean one way or another, and they're around, um, and they're designed so that students are not told what they're supposed to think, but to help students learn how to think. Um, and then we also have some you know, various other things. Next. Uh, strengthening educational systems. I've got the Maryland flag there because one of our major projects is we're actually working um, across the state of Maryland right now through a Department of Education funded project. And it's specifically about building um, teachers' capacity to teach about contested public policy issues in classrooms. So 
uh, last um, this this past academic year, we were working with four Maryland school districts, and in this next academic year, we're offering that to any district that wants to sign on, and that's the high school middle school and elementary level. Um, next. Uh, broadening the legal pipeline. So this takes place in schools, but it's not a necessary. It's not exactly what I was talking about with civic education. But you know, we're a um, we're an organization that was founded with the idea that um, people need to learn about how the law affects them on a practical way. And one of the issues in our country is that the legal profession itself is not terribly diverse. And so. About 20 years ago, we started partnering with corporations like Verizon and McDonald's and also with law firms um, to do programs where the lawyers would actually go into classroom and do some teaching about the law uh, through very interactive uh, method. And then at the end would bring students to their firm or their, their corporation and do role plays, do adult simulations, one of those good uh, prudent practices with the idea that it would help People think about maybe the law is something a uh, career that I would be interested in going into. Um, as we call it, these are early pipeline programs. There are, some, there are other organizations that really concentrate at the college level, um, but there's uh, research that shows that uh, many students, and particularly students of color, start thinking about a legal career before they get to college. So this is a, a, a recent um, capstone where the students went to. This is Epstein, Becker, and Green's New York office. Um, and so those are high school students, and they're doing a simulation. I think where they're they're going to be negotiating a contract. So some of them are going to be the lawyers for one side, some are going to be lawyers for another, and they're going to have to come through the rules. So they're doing some preparation before they do that simulation. Ellie, just by time, is on the board of that. Uh, she she part. is, yeah. Uh -huh. um, and uh, I, I've heard that we're going to bring uh, that Epstein Becker and Green is going to start doing that in DC. I don't know whether Connie knows that, but. Uh, <laughs> And this is a, a, a selection of programs that actually takes place out of school generally. And um, it's working with particularly vulnerable populations about really basic practical uh, things that you need to know about the law. Things like, you know, what do you need to know to get a job uh, about employment law? Um, if you want to rent an apartment, what do you need to know about that? Or open a bank account? Or what are your rights if you're stopped by the, the police? Um, and these are some of the populations that, that we use it with. Um, so this um, uh, last month, uh, we had our, uh, our you know, annual gala, and one of the groups that we honored was the LGBT Center in um, Los Angeles. We partnered with them a couple of years ago to um, bring this legal life skills curriculum, and they've integrated into their work, particularly with uh, young um, LGBT young people that are either have experienced homelessness or at risk of it. And you know, he's talking to them, and even though there's there's no money behind it coming from us, uh, they're still offering those classes once a week, and it's they've integrated into their their offerings. Uh, but we also, um, you know, uh, survivors of domestic violence, youth that are like aging out of the the um, foster care system or that have been in the juvenile justice system and are coming to reentering society um, and a number of other vulnerable groups. So I said, this is, I really talked about what we're doing in the US. We do a lot of stuff overseas as well. I find that really exciting, but, um, uh, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about that. But I think a lot of what we do overseas, it's really, um, it's very similar in terms of the, the types of things we're trying to do. You know, obviously you adapt that to what's going on in that country. You look for the opportunities there. But the, how do we how do we build up um, people like educators, uh, members of the legal profession, um, you know, people that uh, organizations that are serving some of the most vulnerable parts of society, and how do we help them to um, build that knowledge, the, those beliefs and those skills among their population that are going to allow them to be effective citizens and also to be uh, effective advocates for themselves. Mm -hmm. but you can stop sharing. That's okay. <laughs>